atop the pyramid of the C10 truck family sits the 1967 to 72 Chevrolet truck. They've been sought after by hot rodders, mini truckers, off-road builders, and pro touring enthusiasts alike. Dub the Action Line series was a step towards making a more modern and comfortable sporty truck. If the early 60s Chevy trucks were the foundation of the modern C10 craze, then this series is surely the branches that help spawn an entire classic truck industry. Kicked off the Influence and Impact series with the iconic C10 truck. Uh, we started with where the C10 started, 60 to 66, and that's kind of the the start of the popularity of the C10s that we've seen in the last you know 15 years. Let's say um, it was basically you know finding an old truck no one really cared about and doing some cool stuff with it, and. As that evolved, you know, we talk about the patina, the air ride, all of that. Um, but then it kind of started to get into, okay, these are popular. Everyone wants one. You know, you got ones like Red Fox. You had Rodney's, you know, that were kind of like a little bit of an old school style mixed with the patina. Right. Um, and then in 2012, 2013, you know, we were kind of personally involved with uh, Project Lower Learning. And that was a Gil Lara's uh, truck, 15s, white walls on it, kind of an old school two-tone red and white. Um, you know, that was his style. He was kind of a custom, you know, old school kind of guy. And it fit kind of that that old school lowrider theme a little bit. But what was cool is he obviously went with Portabilt. You know, that was kind of the, the air ride that you had to have at that time. Um, but that kind of was one of the first like fully nice kind of painted trucks of those but it wasn't quite like the high-end type of a truck we really kind of started to see that with dell again again with la fonda exactly um and that was you know ls swap magnuson supercharger you know seven eight hundred horsepower yeah um full you know nice paint job done up in fresno you know or Vesalia by you know lee milanich and, and those guys mm -hmm. um that was kind of like the first Top to bottom, nice high end build uh, that we saw was Tino's, you know, La Fonda truck. Well, I think that also too cemented the legend of Dell. Well, you know? and it was, you know, we were joking. It was the combo number three. It was yeah. the Delmo wheels, yeah. You know, which were iconic. Those were the the, the smoothie, you know, like center lines, you know, twenty two, maybe a twenty four. Um, you know, usually they were just powder coated black or, or something similar, right? And then machine the old hubcap on there. That's so right. I was kind of like the old. Like I said, it all it's all borrowing and modernizing old styles because you know you would see that with maybe some of the old shop trucks where they had a steel wheel, but they'd rob the hubcap off the fifty and pop it on there. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, basically just mim mimicking that style. Yes, definitely. And Lafonda was your first, like you mentioned, top to bottom, high end build, no spared expense, build the nicest C10 you can. Mm -hmm. And I've got to give him a lot of credit for that because that's exactly what he did. Now, what I really love is, is that a lot of things that he kept within the same gener or the same era. So, for example, the paint is a paint code from a 64, I think, Corvette. Yeah. So that's he, where the LaFonda came from. That was the fawn was the color. Right, right. right. So that, that what I liked about that is, is that he didn't try to paint it some off brand color that didn't go with the rest of the design. So, mm -hmm. you know, Harley Earl, if he were, would have been alive, he would have really liked that truck. You know, he would have looked at, wow, you took my design, but you still kept it my design, but you modernized it. And, and a lot of people too, one of the first things, you know, and I know this was kind of at the time when the Delmo wheels were starting to kind of become very popular as well. A lot of people don't realize that there was a set of Delmo wheels on one side, and then there was a set of compression wheels. Compression wheels on That's the other right. side. I think it was kind of like bridging the gap a little bit because yeah, it was at SEMA with both sets, and then from then on, it went with the compression wheels all the way around. Right. Um, and that you know they kind of had a similar finish to them, right. you know, all that, but it was definitely a more modern, you know, kind of big wheel approach. So Dell really started to then dive into you know the Dell S3 of taking a completely modern package, but making it look old. So, you know, your script valve covers, script valve covers, you know, with the adapters on there, um, even machining. So you could put a throttle body, you know, a new throttle body under a old school air cleaner, right. To run that oil bath looking yeah. oil cleaner, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, oil air cleaner, cleaner. <laughs> air cleaner. Listen to me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, and that was, like I said, it was kind of the, the style of, of the modernizing of the classic. And that kind right. of really was what 
the C10 guys were were doing. You know, the style of the 2000s with, you know, trucks was tons of fiberglass work and smooth, you know, this and that and big old speakers and this and that. Right. C10 guys weren't really about that. Yeah. It was keeping the classic old school style just with all the modern amenities and, you know, talking about the demo wheels, like demo obviously gets tons of credit for them. Yeah. Um, he kind of made them very popular and that you pretty much no one knew how to get them except through him. Right. But should we call them Dave Neal wheels, not That's, Delmo wheels? Right. Right. So, you know, we're, we're getting into the 67 to 72, which was kind of the quintessential most sought after C10. I mean, that's what most people think of when they say C10. Yeah. They think of that body style. Exactly. Right. And, you know, with Dave Neal's uh, truck, it kind of was a little bit from that, that I mean, yeah, it was yellow and white, but it was that, that Chris Kudo era where it was a chop top. Yeah. It had a lot of custom metal work done to it, but he kept some of the trim on, you know, shaved the door handles, but right. he kept lower trim on there. And he did... 24 inch smoothie wheels with a hubcap on right right and and that was we featured that but that was actually first featured in classic trucks magazine so it's kind of like people were still thinking of those trucks as yeah the classic truck exactly exactly that also too is is kind of a funny story about these wheels because you know as you mentioned earlier you know dell was getting his uh his blank wheels, as a lot of people called them back then. Yeah, blanks. Yeah. You know, because they, they were an uncut billet forging yeah. that normally most billet wheel companies would then window out that blank set, you know, center. Mm -hmm. So to then go to a billet wheel company and say, no, 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 just no machining. Yeah. Just leave them blank. That was totally foreign to them. The, the demo wheels or the Dave Neal wheels yeah. kind of does lead us into the 67 to 72 you know, trucks. Um, so let's take it back a little bit. Okay. Let's kind of go back to the beginning, um, on those trucks in, you know, 66. Yeah. So it was Harry Bradley that designed these cause this Harley That's, Earl, uh, he retired by then. He retired. It yeah. was, you know, that was his last truck that he, he did it was a 60 to 66. So it was kind of the new, new time at GM and, and Harry wasn't at GM for a whole lot of time. No. And, and honestly, you know, the guy that created the, probably most iconic C10, mm -hmm. this was his one hit wonder. This was his time that he designed that truck. It was his one hit wonder at GM. At GM, right. Because he actually, at the time, he was doing designs in Hot Rod Magazine as well yeah. under a different name because he didn't want to get in trouble. Right. Um, but yeah, he, he went on to do Hot Wheels and he actually designed the, the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Yeah. So it was his one hit wonder at GM, but right. he's pretty iconic in the, the overall, you know, car design world. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and there's always also the story too, that, you know, he originally designed the 67 truck with the small back window mm -hmm. and he preferred that back window. And obviously a lot of people looked at it like, well, you know, it's a wider cab and you know, this is a more modern truck. It'd be nice if it didn't have that fifties looking back window. Yeah. So that's where we get the split year where there's actually the late 67s, like the September 67s, as they okay. would call them. Um, they're still a 67 year truck, but they're, they had the larger back window or what they called the panoramic. Did I say that correctly? Uh, panoramic panoramic yeah. back window. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was another big thing because again, too, you know, the, the, even most of the 60 to 66 trucks had the small window as well. They didn't, you know, a lot of them didn't have those large back windows. These definitely were a lot more, you know, slope, you know, on the nose, kind of a little bit more modern i wouldn't say it's a 60s look right it's kind of a like it's kind of hard to pinpoint like i mean obviously this was a 67 72 but like it kind of had a little bit of the chevelle look to it well you know also it, too that's let's go back to you know the 60s 66 has had the atomic look yeah. hey this is what the future is going to look like and everything seemed very clean lines, kind of a little bit more square, not so round. You didn't have the big fins or you didn't have big tails or anything like that on vehicles anymore. You had more refinement, more kind of even aerodynamics were starting to become a thing because yeah, we were building rockets to go to the moon. No. And that's, <laughs> you know, you look at a lot of the automotive, you know, designers and builders, customizers, Hara guys were in the aerospace, you know, industry. So all right. that's going to transfer over. And as things kind of progress, it'll kind of move to that. Um, let's break down some of the, the different year spans. Um, because even I know personally, like your truck is a mix, mix mash. Of yeah. 
certain front ends and cabs and stuff like that to kind of get the best of of the combination of these years. Right. So. Because that that's the, you're right. There's the 67 to 68 has the male slot or what they call the slope nose front end. Right? The grill has your your kind of a hood bar that had a, a bow tie in the middle of it. You're a Chevy. Obviously, if you're a GMC, you still had that hood bar, but had the GMC set in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, to put to kind of also to to break up the two of them, your Chevys had a single headlight, your GMCs had dual headlights. Okay. Um, so it's very easy to kind of now look at the difference between them and say that's a Chevy, that's a GMC. Then you get into your your 69s, your 70s. Um, they're basically kind of the same front end as far as the flat nose grill it's you know it's got a very abrupt kind of uh wide um flat grill and also a wide front bump, uh, hood there but also uh it, it still has that hood bar um and, and in the middle of that hood bar it would have the chevrolet grill so then you get into your 71s and your 72s and that's when the egg crate came out and that's kind of a lot of guys when you say 67 to 72 it's either the, the mail slot grill or it's the egg crate grill it yeah. just kind of works it, out to that me. Way. It was like the, the, the slope nose or like the bowl nose. Exactly. You know? So you had the tall flat hood or, you know, kind of the more stylish, you know, kind of, kind of sleek one. And, um, and that's the thing, you know, they were, like you said, fairly similar design, you know, in all of these. Um, but they did start to kind of upgrade a lot of the amenities later on yes. as these happen. Like, you know, we're talking, uh, 71 was the very first front disc brake. Right. On these trucks. Yes. Yes. You know, and that kind of really showed how it was going from a work truck to a daily drivable, you know, comfortable performing kind of a truck. Well, and I think these were the first trucks that were really kind of built for recreation. You know, they, they, they had a lot of power changes. I mean, now we're looking at 350s, mm-hmm. 396s. You know, they had a big block truck. Yeah. A lot of GMCs were big block trucks. Mm-hmm. And again, it goes back to that um, overhead camper. And maybe you're towing a jet boat behind that. So this was kind of like now the family like RV, right? As still being a work truck too. Because again, let's look at the numbers of short bed to compare it to long beds. You've got... Well, and that's the thing. The the breakdown on, on the, the short bed to long bed on these were kind of still the same as the 60 to 66. You had, you know, I'm looking at 67 and a half, you know, the half ton short beds, uh, 43,000 of these were built. Wow. And 165,000 long beds yes. were built. So we're still looking at the three times the amount yeah. of these were long beds. And that kind of actually even grew, you know, as the years went on. Right. Um, and then, of course, what's been really cool in the last, you know, maybe five to seven years is guys figuring out, especially on the, the 67 to 72 trucks that have that sloping body line. Right. Is they've turned long beds into short beds. Yeah. You know, we, you can do that with a kit, you know, you know, chopping the frame up, yeah. you know, we, we kind of helped develop that kit with brothers, brothers. Yeah. Um, to convert it, you know, from a long bed to a short bed and then new, use new sheet metal. But um, the patina guys back again, some of them wanted a short bed, but they didn't want to ruin the patina. So, all right, let's, you know, metal locks out in, you know, uh, Arizona or, or Sean at Empire, slice a little bit from the front, slice a little bit from the back, shorten it up. All you had was a nice little bare metal line, or you can maybe blend it in, and you had a short bed. Right. Because it was a lot easier to get a short or a long bed than a short bed. Well, let's back up a little bit too, because these were the trucks in my teenage years that were extremely popular yeah because again too growing up in the 80s uh you know this truck is now a 20 25 year old truck so they were affordable plentiful and actually looked good that was like the first like that's a cool looking yeah. truck and there were guys that were building them too even back then you know it was a custom truck even from the when it was started it wasn't a shop truck it wasn't an afterthought like guys actually bought a truck because it looked good and they put a set of u.s mags on it or a pair of Anson wheels on it. And mm-hmm. they drove it around as a style, yeah. you know? So that this is kind of the beginning of that, like guy with his truck and identifies himself as a truck guy. Um, well, I think a lot, I mean, obviously we're getting a little bit of the, the more K10 type stuff, but in the seventies, I mean, these things were hugely popular to be lifted with a, oh, yeah. with a light bar, yeah. you know, on the back and a winch right. bumper, stuff like that. Like yeah. these trucks were getting very customized, you know, just straight out of the gate. Yeah. You know, and there was even two, uh, uh, those trucks actually popped up 
companies that were, you know, GM after a while, they wouldn't outfit people with these parts. So to get replacement parts, this is when you had some people like, for example, uh, Golden State Pickups, you know, Seth DeLuton who uh, uh, founded a company for aftermarket parts that spanned from 50, uh, 55 all the way to 87. Well, he did that because it was so difficult to find parts for even the 67 to 72s. Jim Reese, who mm-hmm. obviously owns classic performance products. Yeah, CPP. Yeah. He actually worked for Seth, and they built a, I think it's a 60, no, it's a 71 uh, monster truck, um, and, and monster truck from the 80s. So we're talking... Yeah. Very little suspension, more or less just large <laughs> just tires, tires, right? Just tires. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they built a very successful monster truck that was called the Boss, and it was uh, uh, sponsored by Arco Fuel, uh, AMPM Mini Mark. Um, you know, and that actually sat on the side of the Peterson Museum, actually sat on the side of the building for more than 10 years. Oh, wow. You know, so that was kind of, you know, one of the iconic things because it was like, wow, hey, this is an old truck that someone fixed up. And people started to kind of look at that. You know, again, I, I look back at some of the uh, guys that from my neighborhood that I grew up in the South Bay. Um, there's Sam Head, who was um, uh, an a auto customizer, upholsterer out of uh, Hermosa Beach. He owned a place called Hermosa Auto Upholstery. And as a kid driving by with my mom or riding skateboards down Aviation Boulevard, he had a shop that used to be full of five or six different C10s being built at the time. Because obviously, him being an upholsterer, the guys that would build a nice custom vehicle would drop it off to have Sam yeah. soap the upholstery. So you would see, and then what I loved about those trucks too is you wouldn't just see one style out of it. Some guys would have a lowrider with like Astro Supremes, mm-hmm. right? With a root beer brown paint job and maybe some, you know, crazy pinstriping. Or you had the guy that was like, I want a Ferrari red truck that, you know, I'm going to put a set of Ansons or center lines, you know? So those trucks didn't have just one identity. Yeah. Um, you know, L- Lucky Costa, who's on, you know, the Hot Rod, uh, uh, Hot Rod Garage, Hot Rod Garage yeah. show. You know, he was another standout back then. He had a 67 big window that was painted, you know, Corvette red that had a full Corvette powertrain back in like 87, you know, a C4 Corvette powertrain inside of 67 back then. That was a big deal, Yeah. you know? Um, so those guys kind of, I think... I look at these trucks today, they've had two lifespans. They've had a lifespan of when it was the 20 year kind of time to, you know, go back and look at those trucks and fix them up because they were affordable. Mm -hmm. And then we had the 35 year lifespan where all of a sudden these trucks were kind of forgot about because maybe they were old man style. And then here comes in guys like, you know, your Dells, your Dinos, you know, um, to to, to kind of upgrade the style. Oh yeah. And Mitch Henderson, you know, yeah. All that kind of really started to come about in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Right. Um, another one that kind of stands out, and it, it was a Blazer, which and we're not going, you know, too far in the Blazer stuff yet, but uh, Little Jumbo Terra. Oh, my God, yes. You know, um, that was, it was a... Okay. Yeah. Give me the rundown on that, because... Right. This is a very... I haven't been able to confirm this, and I know someone out there, one of our listeners, is probably going to be able to confirm this for me. However... Um, this was a special vehicle. It was the same wheelbase as a blazer. It was a unibody construction and it had a removable top. So, but the removable top was more of like an SSR. Mm -hmm. So it didn't have the removable blazer top that looked more like a camper shell. This was like more of a top that you would have just a truck cab, like a truck cab. Yeah. Right. And they made very few of them. I don't know. They actually made, I I thought that they had. No, you know, this was found. Built it. Done yeah, it. yeah. The, these were found because I even ran across a couple of them in wrecking yards in the late 80s. And you better wish you had bought them oh, back then. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. But I couldn't afford it. No. Yeah. You know, um, but those were they are actually made. And again, too, I don't know if they were if they were converted, like if they were just a blazer converted or if it was an actual yeah. GM product. Probably was maybe conversion because there was a lot. The, there was a lot the, of that. The crew cabs and yeah. maybe even some of the extended cabs yeah. that were around. Those were kind of could approved conversions exactly know? and that's you know the railroad mm-hmm. obviously they would have you know crew cabs yeah. uh the forest service would have three doors um you know that was kind of a known thing um but yeah john butera built a removable top truck is the only way i can really explain it yeah. right convertible um, truck, convertible <laughs> truck. Uh, black and silver, amazing look, obviously billet wheels, uh more of a timeless look had like kind of a hollow brand look to it mm-hmm. um and this was 91 90, yeah right so this yeah so this was just kind of that that yeah. era of clean 
you know, hot rod, street rod inspired, yeah. you know, kind of style. And, and it Trader Tim was yeah. another one that, you know, Trader at the times, Trader's truck accessories was the, 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 the giant of Chevy CK trucks, your 88 to 98 trucks. But out of nowhere, he just pulls this 67 truck out. And, you know, that was kind of. I, it's hard to explain that because if you look at that truck right now, it's on billet wheels. It's got a kind of a flashy paint job. Yeah. It's got a two tone red with some white kind of striping going all the way around. It, right. I mean, it does scream that era. It does. You know, John Buteras, we just saw it at the roadster show, you know, a couple I, months ago and it, it's still classic. It, it, yeah. it kind of still looks, yeah. you know, that to me is a sport truck. Yeah. The, 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 the traders truck is well, a sport truck. Take what we see on the trader Tim truck and put that on an 88 to 98 and fits. It, it fits perfectly. Right. You know, you, you talk about custom real, you know, headlights, the two tone, you know, full phantom billet grill. Right. Um, you know, obviously the billet wheels, like it all, and it even had sport mirrors on it. It did. So right. it kind of looked like a C10 version of a sport truck. Yeah. So it was that kind of style. Um, but I mean, he went all out. Uh, that oh. full chassis, yeah. you know. I mean, it was that, was that was a street rod. It was at that time. Yes, you know, and kind of either you were going that route with those trucks, or maybe it was still kind of the old man right. guy on you know the the you know Ruby's you know uh, big Bob's big boy you know Friday night cruise night yeah um, something like that. I mean, you didn't see a lot of these p- popping up in the '90s, kind of early 2000s. Nah. Too much. No. Late eighties, early nineties, trucks were trucks were affordable for guys that couldn't afford a Camaro or a fifty seven Chevy. For the older for the, for the older like, guys. Kind of the older classic right. crowd. Right. The yeah. older classic crowd. The new new trucks. Exactly. A lot of a lot of the young guys were getting new trucks. They already were. That's and, what... and the young guys at that time, they were into mini trucks or yeah. they were into Volkswagens or, you know, something else that was around. But but these trucks, how they survived the eighties was the older guy that didn't have enough money to buy a muscle car. Mm-hmm. Or buy a classic car. Well, and like a lot of them, if these especially, you had more of the 350 you mm-hmm. know, small blocks. So, yeah. hey, probably you use all the same parts. Exactly. You know, that you'd use on a Camaro or a Chevelle or something like that. Right. You know, so that that was still kind of a known thing. Um, but, you know, the, they also survived because they, they built so many of them. And also they they were so iconic. You They, they stuck out. Mm-hmm. They didn't look like the Fords. They didn't look like the Dodges. They didn't look like the last body style that you know Chevrolet produced. So the action line really was kind of a game changer. That was the look at what we can do. And obviously to they've, this day it's stood, still that yeah, way. Yeah, they've definitely stood the test of time. Um I mean you started to see some of these starting to pop up in the mid two thousands that were full custom, you know, laid out, had some tricks on it. Like I remember um I think a guy named Mike up in Porterville um he had a red one. He was a GMC. Okay. Um and it was, yeah, laid out, you know, z the front of the frame and, or I think might've even done a full KRZ chassis on it. I, now uh, I remember what you're saying. Yeah. And that's, I mean, yes. I think, and that's what it was. It was kind of back to the same thing with like Chris Kudos where, yeah, some mini truck guys were, were working on these, but one of the reasons is because they were cheap and you could just cut it up and do whatever you wanted to. Them. Well, let's look at the Mad Eye truck, you know? You look at yeah. Carrie and those guys yep. up there at I have customs. At I have yeah. customs, you know, and that was a truck that was built obviously for a for a, a tribute to their friend Matt mm. that had passed away. He was you know worked at their shop and and had built a lot of stuff with them, but and he was in the middle of building a truck. So what I loved about it is is that they they finished the truck to kind of road status. Yeah, so but they, it was they drove it from oh, California to Mississippi uh, ex- for show fest, right? I mean. But was yeah. beautiful. But that but that also kind of gave us wow, these things can do more than just be a Boulevard cruiser because they put an LS engine in. When LS engine swaps were, that was Frankenstein stuff. That was yeah. like, how did no you one, do this? Yeah, you were you were making your own wiring yeah. harness. You were, yeah. you know, someone was retuning the computer. Like right. You were, and it was an LS1. Exactly. Like this Corvette yeah. engine yes. 5.7, not, yes. you know, the truck motor 5.3. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. they, and, they, and they left it bare metal. Mm-hmm. So that was the other thing of like, well, you saw everything. You like there was well, no sh- these were metal fab guys. Yeah. So it showed off some of the, yeah. their metal work, their right. skills, you know, and that's kind of what was very popular in the and we say mini truck, you know, as kind of the the general overall term. Right. You know, for that kind of scene, but that's what was kind of popular was full custom metal work. As it kind of went along, we started to see kind of a little bit of those two kind of blend together a little bit. Um 
one of those ones that stand out was for me, and it was you know, one of my favorite kind of first covers that I actually shot for street trucks was Scott Lawrence's uh, GMC. Okay. Yes. Ooh, and I remember that. The yeah. Orange one. Yeah. The orange one. Yeah. You know, AccuWare made that very iconic. Yeah. Um, for their kind of you know marketing and, and ad campaign, and that had a full chassis because that was you know guys up in Central California. Yeah. I mean, you know, from KRZ to Chop and Block to all that kind of stuff, you know, you had a Silverado or a truck or whatever, you're putting a full Mandrobent frame under it. Yeah. So, okay, well, hey, we got a C10, you know, let's put a Mandrobent frame under right. it. But, you know, he kept all the handles, kept all the trim on it. And that was 2008. I know. I you know, know. But it was a high end yeah. build. And that was because, yeah, you know, he was a farm com- farm community guy. His, I think his parents owned a couple of John Deere tractor yeah. franchises. So, they had some money and hey, why not build a nice truck? Yeah. You know, there was a, a street rod shop up in Central California from the 80s into the 90s into the 2000s that a lot of these, a lot of this talent that's out of the Central Valley either worked for mm-hmm. or had been associated with the shop. And they were called, it was actually called Snow White. Okay. And there was a guy by the name, his nickname was Snow White. Um, and this was kind of like, I kind of look at this as the Boyd shop of, for trucks. You know, if okay, Boyd caught him... The, the Boyd University. Exactly. Yeah, you know, Boyd, Boyd had so much talent go through his shop. So did Snow White. Snow White had all these guys that went through there that, you know, your your, your Jeff Sanders, mm-hmm. um, you know, just the, the guys that kind of paved that way for the chassis uh, yeah. uh, trucks. You know, and a lot of that did come from out of the Central Valley. Mm-hmm. You know, because again, if, if you're, you're going to build a, a chassis for a 38 Chevy car, well, then a 67 Chevy truck's got to be pretty easy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's definitely easier. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, and, you know, those guys also, too, there was the, the I remember they always call it a body dropless chassis, which was basically just zine the frame. Well, or the body dropless chassis was, yeah, you back then, if you were body dropping, you were essentially channeling. Right. You know, you were raising the floor up. Yeah putting a, you know, two or three inch little extra piece of sheet metal along the side of the floor. And yeah, it was lifting the floor. Yeah. You were, well, you were basically lowering the body. You were lowering the body over the chassis so that then the pinch or the rockers were hitting the ground. Right. Um, But yeah, the body dropless chassis, basically you're using smaller tubing, you know, but it's all boxed in. So it's a lot stronger and you didn't have to cut really that much of the floor right so that was kind of the whole body drop list is you're not dropping the body yeah you're just replacing the chassis yeah so obviously it's it's a nicer way to do it more work a little bit more money but a lot more custom and that was kind of the name of the game is like yeah. how custom can we be well and and one thing that i miss about those trucks or and actually even about that era i can remember back where where finnegan and i actually finnegan picked up a truck and this is the other thing that's really funny about the action line trucks even back then, uh, the short beds kept their value from mm-hmm. day one. Yeah. I mean, even in the 80s, to get a clean short bed, you were still spending five or six thousand dollars. And even into the 90s, that truck was five or six thousand dollars without an engine, right? Where a long bed, five hundred dollars all day long. Yeah, right. Um, fin- there was a lot more of them. So, and there was there was a lot more of them, so it was easier to <laughs> yeah. you know obviously find one that was yeah. So you that's know, also supply right. and demand. So supply it's going to be cheaper too. Yeah. Totally. I remember that Finnegan brought home a cab. Like he called me one day and said, "Hey, I got this cab. We need to go pick it up." Blah blah blah. I said, "Okay." So we went over and picked it up, and it was just a cab. And I, I didn't really know what he was thinking, but he goes, "I'm going to build a full blown chassis with hydraulics and put a big block Chevy in it." And this is probably 2006, maybe 2007. And to me, I was like, why? Yeah. You know, like <laughs> that just, that just sounds like horrible. But, you know, we, we, we sat there and laid out a chassis. Like, I mean, we home built the chassis, right? I mean, threw a, a level on the ground and just started building. Didn't yeah. know any better. Well, no. And that's that time period was chassis. Really. Yeah. Like that was the thing to do for truck in the truck world was yeah. build a chassis. Right. Now, unfortunately, and and I know if Finnegan, if you're listening, you're going to finally have redemption. So w- I wasn't able to help him finish that chassis at my house. It was kind of, you know, limitations, right? I mean, we had a, I remember we had a mandrel, I'm sorry, we had a uh, manual tubing bender that I had to redhead stud into the garage floor mm-hmm. so I could bend tubing, right? Um, so we ended up going over to a friend of our shop named Jim Imes, and uh, he, he was a, a, a talented fabricator. Um, but had a big mouth 
and said, of course, I can do everything that you want, Finnegan, just drop it off here. And uh, it sat there for maybe about a year or two until finally um, Jim cut it up and disposed of it because the wheels were stolen off of it. Now, this is the funny thing. And I know I'm getting off into a tangent here, but it's a great story. The hilarious thing is Finnegan had some billet wheels, some intro wheels on this, this roller at the time. And Jim had pushed it outside and somebody had come by his building and stole the wheels. And, you know, of course, Finnegan gets word of it and we go over there to look at it. Well, lo and behold, when Finnegan and I are stopping, as we're driving to Jim's shop, we stop to get gas. And lo and behold, this guy pulls into a gas station with a square body truck with Finnegan's wheels. Mm. And of course, Finnegan goes, those are my wheels. And I'm like, whoa, hold on, cowboy. (laughs) How do you know they're yours? Yeah. Yeah, we don't know what we're walking into. Right, right and also, too, the guys that were in the truck were pretty big, right? <laughs> so, you know, hold on a sec here. So Finnegan couldn't, he, he had to walk up and, and, and confront the guys, and they were like, show me. And the crazy thing about it was Finnegan goes, I put my initials on the inside of my wheels. I can prove they're mine. Okay, A, who does that? Right. And good thing he did that. No, but no, no. Yeah. But, but see, and, and again, I don't have Mike here. I think he was calling their bluff. Maybe. Because True. Finnegan goes, hey, I'm going to call the cops, and I've got my initials on those wheels. Yeah, like you're screwed. You're screwed. Yeah. The guy looked at, looked at Finnegan, didn't say a word, got in the truck, and took off. Oh, so he just bounced. <laughs> so basically, he knew, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm screwed, Yeah. right? I remember, you know, the patina thing starting to come out. Obviously, with Dell and with those guys, it really kind of set the mark on these with a truck called Nacho. Yes. Now it's kind of a gold, you know, Mason actually bought it down in Tijuana. That's right. It was a truck from Mexico, and that's hence Nacho. Yeah. And it had a really nice gold kind of, I don't know what color it's that desert is. desert tan. Desert tan. Yeah. Um, you know, patina on it. And obviously the reason for keeping that, I mean, he drove that truck everywhere. He yeah. He would take it camping in Yosemite. Right. He would take it, you know, out to the Glamis, to the dunes, to, you know, towing. Yeah a, you know, his uh, tent trailer and stuff behind it in our tent trailer yeah. while it was bagged. Right. While I was laid out on Porterbilt. Yeah. And so that was kind of the thing of not, don't worry about scratching it. Right. Just enjoy it. Yeah. And, and I remember sh- when I was shooting that, you know, compared to shooting Dell's truck, he was like, Hey, this is finished. This is done. This isn't under construction. This is, this, this is patina, but this is it. This is it. Yeah. You know, and that kind of really, you know, help popularize kind of that style in the patina world. Right. Um, and you started to see from there a couple of these, I think these ones, the 6772 were the first of that era to then really start to see high end builds. I mean, uh, we're talking about, yeah. we talked about La Fonda with right. 6066, but there's a couple earlier ones with these where they really started to, to get, you know, built into a nice, you know, high end truck. Uh, obviously we talked about Scott, you know, Lawrence's yeah. that was kind of a little bit earlier. Right. Uh, and that was kind of, I think just a tail end of, of some earlier trucks. But, um, you look at obviously, you know, Dave Neal's, mm-hmm. but I think Mitch Henderson's, you know, truck, yeah. and that was straight up street rod, hundred percent street rod <laughs> built by street rod guys, yeah. street rod designer. And, you know, Mitch, yeah, he had, you know, CK trucks in the past, but you know, Previous to that, he did a 37, you know, kit car street rod. Well, well Mitch always had a, uh, a throwback design to him. Mm-hmm. Even his, his 88 to 98 extended cab that he had, uh, the one that burned in the trailer. Yeah. Um, that had a, uh, uh, a Ford, I want to say a Ford, like a shoebox dashboard in it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely you know, had something he always had a throwback. Style. Yeah. He had yeah. kind of a throwback look. And, and when sexual chocolate came out, Oh yeah. I forgot. That's the name. <laughs> I know. Right. That's the greatest thing. This is also when names became kind of a big thing. Yeah. Right? Well, Everyone had a that name came from the magazine. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. We title it something. So right. then other people thought they had to name yeah. their truck. Yeah. So when Mitch came out with sexual chocolate, the whole idea, cause I remember he called Travis and said, I'm going to build this, you know, truck. I'm, I'm going to do late model stuff. You know, and, 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 and back then we were still a little bit leery, you know, it was kind of like, well, Mitch, it's a sec, you know, it's a 67, you know, this and that. But the unique thing was, um, obviously, you know, the guys at status helped them out with that. You know, Mitch was part of that, that crew then too. And, um, you know, they won a GM design award with that truck. That's true. And that's, that was kind of unheard of for a truck. Right. Right. You know, and, and even an, and, and then also an old truck. Well, yeah. It's, but yeah, an old you know, truck. Yeah. Usually you would see like the, the, the current, Camaro. 
yeah. or, or, you know, a, obviously a car or a current body style truck that would win that award. It was kind of, you know, given to that yeah. thing. But for them, they're trying to sell their new they're truck. They're trying to sell the so, new truck, right. Yeah, so for them to give Mitch that award, that was like, whoa, wait a second. We're on to something. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're recognizing this at a level of, you know, the, 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 at the SEMA show. So maybe more people are going to build this. And I think one of the reasons why it probably got the design award is because it still had a lot of, a GM. Lot of the GM mm-hmm. in it. Right. You know, we're, we're going back to, like I said, this was the time of keeping all the trim, the handles yeah. on it and refining it all. Right. And that was all still there. Like we yeah. know the SEMA guys or the, you know, Ford GM, especially at SEMA with the dollar vehicles, they like that if it still has an emblem. Exactly. It, it still has the yeah. badging. Like yeah. they don't want you to take away too much from what their designers did. Right. You know, almost like it's kind of like insulting their designers. It, I always felt that way. But it's more, I think, accentuating what they're doing. Yes. You yes. Know, it's it's kind of like you're taking what the designer probably really wanted right. and making that happen versus obviously when it goes through engineering and goes through, you know, all the safety and stuff that they have to do, right. it goes away from the original design. Yeah. I, I, and, and you know, that also opened up the floodgates though, because you know, the next year at SEMA and I, and again, I, I'm blending SEMAs because I've, you know, it, it, it all kind of does blend <laughs> yeah. together and we, we tend to forget, but yeah. we have, you know, then you get walk into Mike Losh yeah. with, cloud with nine. cloud nine and he'd been building that for a few years. Too. Well, that was his grandfather's truck. Yeah. So it was a lineage type vehicle that he wasn't going to get rid of it. So, you know, he had kind of done a few versions of it. That's why I think he, is he on version 3.0 right now, I think? Well, now, yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's redone a few right. times now. But right. that was, yeah, that was the, the first kind of right. s- stage that it set. And, right. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, that thing, like I said, it had all the trim on it. But mm-hmm. to me, what stood out on on that was the interior. It, exactly. Um, I mean, uh, and under the hood was super clean. Yes. You know, not people weren't paying as much attention under the hood. Right. And, you know, and, and he still had the small block, right. I believe. He didn't mm-hmm. have an LS. Not, but, not, not yet. You know, he's slush tubs. So yeah. nice new inner fenders that were color matched. You know, a lot of people weren't doing that you right. know, quite at that time. But the interior on that was a very, you know, mimicking kind of the 70s style with the plaid, you know, but all done in a nice, tasteful way. And, and so that's what's really funny about it is the first time I saw that, because I saw it at SEMA show and the interior, I just, I could not stop talking about the interior. Mm-hmm. You know, it had that plaid body cloth for the inserts, um, but it still shared, you know, a little bit of leather. So because at that time it was leather, everything, you just basically made it look like the inside of a coffin. Um, but, you know, he brought color out. And, and the funny thing was, is everybody was like, oh, he's got Porsche inserts because Porsche in the early yeah, 70s, they the, used a lot of plaids, yeah. you know, Volkswagen, Porsche, Volkswagen, Porsche, a lot of German cars. Yes. But what's funny is that's actually 73 body cloth from the square bodies, mm. right? Because few, uh, and of yeah, course, a lot truck- of GM guys know like, okay, houndstooth, mm-hmm. but houndstooth honestly was the car uh, yeah. pattern and the plaid was the truck pattern. Mm-hmm. But we'll get into well, that when we talk about, talk about square well, bodies. No, and that's, yeah. I mean, the houndstooth to me says muscle car yeah. and the plaid says work truck, yeah. you know, that's because plaid and flannel, Mm-hmm. You know, for many years was always lumberjacks. Or totally. So it's like, okay, that makes sense with, a you know, a, a truck design. Right, right. Um, and that's, I mean, we're getting a little bit ahead because I think around that time there were some other, you know, C10s that were kind of being mixed in, bringing in some of the autocross and the performance sure. type to this. Um, I mean, I remember like uh, Rob Phillips. Yeah. With his, you know, C10. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was from Overholland. You know, he was from the, the kind of the Chip Foose University, yeah. if, you, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. And so he had, you know, his C10 that was two-toned. Oh, it was beautiful. You know, beautiful truck, yeah. show truck, chrome wheels. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I remember at being at Good Guys Del Mar, the first time he took it around the autocross oh, track. And he yeah. was so nervous oh, about yeah. it. Yeah. And, but then he was so excited. And yeah. Then basically, he... You know, he ended up almost redoing half that truck, and then of course building a full blown race truck. Well, yeah, but. and and that, okay, so that's the other thing too. Um, Rob Phillips obviously has is known now for mm-hmm. the C10R. Yes. Okay, and a lot of people think that that was his first his sixty nine. No, it's and it's not. It's yeah, a different it's truck. Different. You know, um, and and, he, and I remember he built that truck, and it was beautiful, and it had bare brakes on it, and Bear had asked him to come down to Del Mar, mm-hmm. and uh, to just to put the truck in the booth and display it. And of course, we were messing around with the autocross and 
you know, yeah, different kind of no stuff. Limit engineering, yeah, we're working know, with Rob, Rob McGregor, like yeah. right? You know, him at No Limit Engineering. Um, and so we needed more truck. It, it, it wasn't. It was just, well, hey, we're doing this. Rob, you're here. Can you come over and run the, the truck through yeah. so we can get more people? Over? And he didn't want to do it. He was like, oh, man, it's well, a, it's, you know, you know, it was a show truck. It was a show truck. It yeah. was very clean. And I, I remember telling him, hey, Rob, you're going to have a blast, dude. And that truck, if you look at it now for autocross, it was like everything wrong. Yeah. Had big block Chevy in it. Mm-hmm. I think a Turbo 400. Um, you know, had oversized wheels that weren't yeah. the right size for, you know, for autocross or for grip use. Um, but, you know, it was a really nice looking truck and it was a, a, definitely a crowd pleaser and a, and a good guy show. It being painted and nice, of course, yeah, everybody was looking at it. Red, yeah, can it kind of red and yeah. black. It, yeah, right. So you know, he went out there and, and, and you know went around the course. And I remember, like you said, he was just a kid on Christmas when he came back. He was just like, "This is the greatest thing I've ever done." Mm-hmm. And that turned into his style for a little while because that big old big block made a lot of steam, but you just could not get the thing to go around no, the corner. You just had so much weight that you're just ooh, right. You're basically trying to you know pull it around, right? Pushing it around. So and, his style for a while was more drift cross. Then autocross, you know, he'd come into a corner and instead of trying to make the corner, he'd just blow the back into the thing around and kind of drift around the corner. Mm. And it wasn't until his future wife, who was racing yeah, her she Camaro. Was racing Camaro. Right. Yeah, Brandy. You know, Brand- Brandy yeah. Morrow. Um, you know, she was uh, her dad was obviously the the, the head guy there at uh, Spectre, Spectre for a long time. Yeah, and they built a really nice second gen Camaro that she was deadly fast in. Um, you know, she was kind of the one that started kind of giving him little like you know, it'd be a lot better if you made the thing handle instead mm-hmm. of it just drifting around. So that was kind of a call out, I think. I think that those two, like that was kind of their little romance that got together because obviously they went on to, you know, get married and have a few kids. And, yeah, you know, then the Rob, truck. Rob built the C10R truck for Brandy. Yeah. You know, that was more or less like, I'm going to build this to put her in the seat and let her, you know, kind of campaign that truck. And, and, and obviously the success they had with that truck was amazing. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about, you know, Autocross and, and performance trucks. I mean, you can't talk about that without mentioning Hellboy. Yeah, I mean, that yeah, that was a v- extremely dramatic custom yeah. C10 built 100 percent for race. Yeah, you know that was a funny story because um, Rob McGregor, a good friend of ours, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff with him throughout the years when he was here in California, um, and you know, he's been a chassis builder for you know three decades now, four mm-hmm. decades. Yeah, I mean that's you know basically yeah his. Specialty is suspension. And exactly. Yeah. So, you know, to him, he was uh, a, a big F100 guy mm-hmm. and had a lot of customers with F100s. And he built a chassis that uh, uh, he wanted to show off that chassis. So what we did is we pulled the, the fenders off of it. It was a 55 F100 truck. Yeah. Silver bullet. Silver bullet. And we pulled the fenders off of it to go autocrossing to show everybody at the good guy show. Hey, look, we're out here racing this. This is the latest product. If you want to purchase it, you can purchase one. And, and do yeah. it yourself. And, yeah, might as well show all of it right. off as much as possible, yeah. Now, there was a company that wasn't very happy with that. There was a competitor of his that wasn't very happy with the fact that he could take off fenders and beat him in a truck because this company was actually campaigning a Camaro with their products. Yeah, with all their suspension on And, uh, you know, I'm just going to flat out say it, Detroit Speed, they were not happy. Yeah. The, the, well, they said you can't, this is autocross, you can't bring a race truck. Right. Here, and it's like, why is it a race truck? Because yeah. it has, you know, it's a it's a production chassis that he makes that you could you put. You can buy anything. one too, Kyle. <laughs> it's it's, you know, had yeah, it had a roll cage and stuff like that. It's like it's still street legal. It it's still, still had legal. right headlights, yeah, wipers, yeah, fully re- legal, registered on the street. Because like, at that time, the good guys class was you had to have a registered vehicle. Yeah. To ride, you know, so you had to have windshield wipers, you had mm-hmm. to have turn signals, you had to have all and of these items, all of that. and it had all of that. Yeah, the it only thing it didn't have didn't have fenders. <laughs> yeah, it just looked a little more right. like an open wheel race car. So I remember one year that we finished out. We didn't win the championship that year, but we did finish out beating DSE in a few events. Mm-hmm. And Kyle's ex wife Stacy was not happy about that at all. Yeah, and they had approached the good guys and they said, "Look, you guys got to do something different." And I remember the next year, uh, we called these the Rob rules. There were seven new rules to to good guys autocross. That was basically a a, a point to us. Mm-hmm. So the, I remember Rob saying, "If that's what you guys want, and you guys think that's a race car, just wait until what I bring back next year." Yeah, I'll build a race car. And that was Hellboy. <laughs> yeah. Hellboy was purposely built to go after DSE. That to me, Hellboy was basically a NASCAR or trophy truck. 
with a, with C10 sheet metal on it. So Rob McGregor, by the way, is a genius. If you get to talk to the guy and if he if you actually can get him to engage in a conversation, he is a genius. And he's worked for a lot of different manufacturers throughout the past, you know, either collaborated or even too. a lot of his information, a lot of his knowledge came from racing uh, Nissans because he mm. worked at NTPI, which was Nissan Racing Technology back in the late 80s. And it was a moonlight job, but he um, learned a lot from that and learned a lot about construction of, of actual race cars. So Hellboy showed up. I was around knocking around and my idea was I was trying to build something very similar, but I had a lot of off-road influence. So to mm-hmm. me, I was looking at trophy truck manufacturing and how that, you know, they built a chassis and, and, and in ways, you know, how different suspensions work. So to me, it was kind of like, Hey Rob, why don't we look at the way they're building these and then take your technology of the way you're, you've learned from Nissan and let's kind of marry the two of those together and build a badass C10. And this thing too, we knew like this was a ground up, you know, crumple a paper type thing, like yeah, start from scratch. Start from scratch. You guys changed the wheelbase on it too. We right? changed the wheelbase. Now, now, here's a real funny thing. So, for you guys listening out there, and, and you got your your purists, Hellboy is a GMC Longhorn. Okay, I think, yeah, we haven't gotten into too many of the different you know, right. versions and all that stuff because you had the the six and a half foot short bed, mm-hmm. you had the eight foot long bed, and you had a ten foot and bed, you had a ten foot bed. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, and again, that that was geared more towards those motorhome or those cab over yeah. campers. Where, hey, if you can have a ten foot bed, well, why not have a bigger camper? So, mm-hmm. you know, those were the Sierra Grandes or the Longhorns. Yeah. I think GMC was Sierra Grande and yeah, Chevrolet Sierra was a Longhorn. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, Hellboy was a Longhorn. Uh, he bought it on Christmas day in I think 2011. And by new year's week, we had the thing as, as a roller and it was the, our, 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 our recipe was three thirty five tires wide all the way around LS powered quick change rear end shortened wheelbase. Um, that was kind of the loose recipe. Yeah. That was the, 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 the bones of it. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what wasn't the, you guys shorten the, the wheelbase down to basically be the exact same as a Camaro. That was the idea. So basically you're not racing a truck out on the track. You're no. racing, you're, you're in a Camaro and, going against other and Camaros. And that was directly because of DSE. We, we wanted to beat them on their platform. Mm-hmm. It was like, okay, if we're a truck and you're a Camaro and we're not supposed to be able to beat you, well, if at least if we're on the same level playing field, then we got it, you know, every chance to beat you. And uh, so, you know, we, we made the good guy show 2012, the, the spring yeah, Del Mar, spring Delmar. Yep. Um, and debuted the truck there and talk about controversy. Oh, for sure. And oh. I mean, even too, but like not just the, the functionality of it, but it, it, the thing had some style. Like it had yeah. a chop top. Yeah. You know, yeah. you did wide metal wide fenders on it with the, you know, the, what was it, the wide five uh, wheels? The, yeah. And that, that was, was kind of like the old, you know, sprint car, you know. Oh, no, no. You know, that, that was inspired. so. So Will Wood, um, Bill Wood, he, his claim to fame is that, is that he took an airplane brake that has the wide five pattern mm-hmm. that are super lightweight. Like they yeah. came on like Piper Cubs. So you're talking about an airplane that has like, you know, 60 horsepower. So everything's got to be super, super yeah, light. Right. Mm-hmm. So they had these aluminum, they're, and they're actually hollow hubs that have a strange pattern. That's why they're called wide five. So we use those brakes. Um, which mean that meant that we had to actually build our own custom wheels because no one had a wide five pattern in a, in a, you know, an, an 18 inch wheel. So we had to machine our own wheels. Um, we moved the motor back. We put the radiator yeah. in the bed. Yeah. I mean, that's all race car trophy truck stuff. Yeah. It totally is. You know, and, and if you were really to, you know, obviously we made it a unibody, so we couldn't take the bed sides off, but if you were able to take the bed sides off, it would look more like a trophy truck. Yeah. It had the radiator in the back, it had the fuel cell right over the axle, um, you know, a lot of the electronics, everything, it had a tonneau cover that, you know, of course kept that hidden. Um, but inside nothing but business race seats, straight up gauges, um, very Spartan. Um, mm-hmm. even the doors, they don't have window frames because there's no windows in that truck. Yeah. So you just got the front windshield, rear windshield, front windshield, rear windshield, yeah. um, carbon fiber hood. Yeah. Um, you but know, you still had headlights, Wipers, like said, still street had legal. To be all street legal. Had to be street legal to be able to compete in that That's right. class. So, and Rob went on to, of, of course, Hellboy's had a very illustrious career and has even been featured by Chevrolet on their hundredth anniversary. Oh. Um, that was a very key um, 
uh, vehicle that they campaigned. So and Dina was uh, featured on that hundred year that's right. Chevy commercial deal as that's right. well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously the action line 67 to 72 brought in a lot more performance oriented stuff. I mean, like I think the 6066, like maybe a couple people have done some stuff like a Pike's peak truck, the gas monkey did. Yeah. But if you're talking performance, like muscle car, muscle truck, like, you definitely had the 67 to 72. So yeah. that was kind of a lot more in tune with that kind of style and that setup, you know, as far as the truck goes. Yeah. And, and, and I'll say that, you know, even myself, I've, I've had a handful of them mm-hmm. over, you know. Well, as I say, I mean, the, you're, you're, the counter, the balance to, to Hellboy was Foxy. Exactly. Um, and because at first, I wanted to build Hellboy. You wanted to go all out. I wanted to full, go all out. Full custom. Yeah. And, but it wasn't as much of what Hellboy was because, you know, Rob had his ideas. Mm. So, you know, Rob came in with, you know, look, I, I mean, this, this is one of the, the big ideas that really kind of, you know, stands out to me is he built a custom floor in the car for aerodynamics. So if you look underneath Hellboy, Hellboy has like four inch sections that are set in a Chevron design throughout mm. the, the entire floorboard. And that's for downforce because the, 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 the wheels are so wide that it's allowing so much air to come through those wheels. Oh. It needs to redirect that wheel. You, you out, want that yeah, negative out. out of it so you get more downforce, mm-hmm. right? If you have a big cushion yeah, of air lift, underneath you, you're getting lift. I mean, this is why right? we have airplanes. That's why we have airplanes, right? Wings for lift. Right. Yeah, so you but want. that was all stuff that Rob learned from working with the guys at Nissan and all the, you know, the, the prototype cars that he was building. Yeah. So, you know, you look at, like I said, Hellboy is a C10 prototype. It's probably the easiest way to explain it. C10 race car prototype. Exactly. Race car prototype. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Now, Foxy was the street version of it. It was, I still wanted the technology that we were working on. I still wanted those wide, like, you know, Foxy runs a set of 315s all the way around on an 11-inch wheel. Um, so I still wanted that pro touring grip, but I wanted it to be more creature comfort. Windows, interior. Yeah. And have some style to it. Yeah. yeah. You know, nice paint job, that kind of thing. So, you know, people kind of identify it mm-hmm. and still looks, you know, performance. But obviously, too, I still wanted a fire breathing, you know, LS power deal. So, you know, at first I built a Stroker 408, naturally aspirated uh, LS engine that made about 560 horsepower and put behind a Turbo 400 with a Gear Vendors Overdrive and a nine inch rear end. Um, it's a pretty bulletproof combination yeah i mean that's something that i could hammer on it hard do burnouts do donuts it's pr- probably not going to do anything except for waste tires um but you know then i can also get on the freeway and drive the thing to santa barbara yeah well and that's because yeah you you know talking about you know chassis and stuff that helbo had that was factory frame but with all the upgraded you know no limit parts so you had your front coil over you know your rear coil over conversion on right it. so it was all well, Rob, too. You know, just kind of basically off-the-shelf parts. Yeah, but Rob also did something that a lot of the guys in the C10 world didn't think about, and that was to back half. And this kind of also yeah. introduces the three-quarter ch- uh, kit, you know, like the the where you'd actually cut the back of the frame and, and, and install new frame rails. Mm-hmm. I mean, Porterbilt did the, the same similar thing. Chopping Block did the same yeah. similar thing. Basically, all you need is kind of the, the, the middle section of the frame. Exactly. You know, and that's jumping back and forth a little bit, but like Dell kind of got into that mode where he would build spec chassis right because all he needed was frame rails yeah build them and then oh oh, hey now this customer comes in he's got this truck got it on deck cool i can drop it on this frame and get it out the door quick yeah yeah so you know and that and that basically kind of came from you know i was talking to rob and i'm like hey art morrison builds back halves for chevelles and novas and camaros why can't we build back halves for c10 well and, and that was a long bed Originally, too. So it yeah. also solves that problem That's right. of going from a long bed to a Which short bed. Which Foxy I pulled out of the guy's backyard for 500 bucks. Yeah. Oh, and that's what you could get for him at the time. That's what I could get for him. <laughs> and it was a long bed. Yeah. It was a long bed 71, even though I call it a 68 because it's a lot easier just well, to let people, because it has a 68. People are going to argue with you right. when you say that because of the front end. Right. And but even, too, I have 67 fenders on it if you really want to start you know, the, yeah, splitting you hair because I, I don't have the side markers, yeah. right? But it's just easier. Hey, it's a 68. It's a yeah. big window. It's got a slot. You know, it's got the, the, the slant nose hood. Just call it a 68. But this was a 71. It had a big block in it. Uh, pulled it out of a guy's yard and, you know, took it to Rob's. And we just started kind of cutting in. Where does this all line up? 
Uh, we figured out that long beds and short beds still share a similar mounting hole. So mm -hmm. we were able to use that as a reference and cut the frame in half, built the back half. And Rob was already building independent front suspensions. So rather than him with his F100s where the suspension dropped in from the top of the rail, the C10s had a lower center of gravity and a lower scrub rate. Yeah or lo lo lower scrub line. So what we ended up doing was is just inverting his uh, front suspension upside down hmm. and and bolted the cross member in from the bottom. And, and and we got that cue from, you know, Nathan Porter. He was doing that. He was already doing well, no, that. No, you're just basically replacing the, the, the front cross member. Right. You know. And it and, wasn't and, anything. And I mean, Chevy, that Chevy, they, they unbolt stock that way too. Yeah. You know, so there you're wasn't any great. Taking a look at what was already there yeah. and then, yeah. okay, hey, this is what we got to do to make it happen. And basically and using it. what we had. Yeah. Right. Um, and now I look at those vehicles. I mean, now let's flash forward 10 years and let's look at $300,000 C10s that are going across the, the, the. Yeah. Bear Jackson. Bear Jackson yeah. or Mecham or any of those places. And they're still LS powered rack and pinion steering, you know, large brakes. I think all of that came from that 10 year era where we were trying to autocross. Well, it, it became, it, it, a lot of it did kind of blend over from the muscle car, the high end muscle car builds, yeah. you know, the performance of, of having kind of everything at it. It's, it's now kind of like, okay, you could have a C10 or a Camaro. Yeah. And if you're doing everything top to bottom of it, high quality parts, it's costing the same. Yeah. You know, it used to be where a truck was a lot cheaper to get, a lot sure. cheaper to build, you know, but you kind of look at it. Okay. You've got pretty much the same size brakes. Yeah. Got the same power plant. You know, you've got the same, if not more suspension work. Right. Body paint and interior is all going to be about the same, no matter right. what you're doing. So, you know, you, you, we're, we're, we're starting to kind of get into the era of your six figure truck builds. Right. You know, um, there is, I think to me, in my opinion, one of my favorite of these trucks that kind of bridged the gap from the patina era to the, the high end era. And that's Hazel. Oh my God. You know, Keith, one Stevens, of my favorites, Keith yes. Stevens, you know, truck. And, and this is cause he's, you know, a guy that's in relaxed atmosphere, but worked at a street rod shop, Yeah, you know? And so he took a beautifully patinaed. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a, a nicer I know color patina you know blues and the oranges yeah. and all that kind of stuff um but he took everything else under it and made it super nice i mean yeah. the interior he and, he and he did do it in his garage sure for the interior but he painted the, yeah. the whole inside of the interior you know right. that turquoise color yeah so it wasn't patinaed like the, the patina was on the outside but right. inside under the hood you know nice venting you know done like the firewall was all smooth yeah like Everything was nice on the cover um, or under the hood. And and I remember, you know, when we shot that, I, I had him specifically, you know, take a shot of it, leave the camera in the same spot. Okay, now open the hood. Yeah. You know, and then I kind of ghosted, kind of ghosted the, uh, the the engine bay under it because right. I wanted to put that truck on the cover. Yeah. Because we I knew, you know, we knew that patina was very popular, um, but it was, it's a hard sell to guys that didn't, yeah. weren't kind of in the know of, oh, this is what people are doing, or no, this is just an old, crappy-looking tr truck. Well, it, it doesn't go with the magazine format. You know, you wouldn't put yeah. an old-looking anything yeah, be, on a cover of a yeah. truck. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, even if you were a magazine of, you know, guns, you wouldn't put an old gun on the cover yeah, unless it's, it's got unless, a story. Yeah, yeah right. Unless it has some historic value. It's got some historic, historic but yeah. And, you know, and that's what yeah. Keith, I think, he also, too, what I loved about that truck is that he let that truck tell its story. Yeah. Rather than redoing it and, 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 you know, painting it up to the, the, the current, you know, liking of somebody, he's like, this thing's got a story. I'm going to leave it. Yeah, It looks nice. Let me leave that as, yeah. as is. But, you know, same what kind of Dell and all those guys were doing is, yeah, he upgraded everything underneath, but he took it a step further where he made everything street rod quality right. underneath. Yeah. And, you know, and inside on the interior. And so that kind of, Things started, the game started slowly kind of come up, you know, right. and then you start getting into like old ox, you know, oh, yeah. owned by Dell. Oh my God. I forgot. Where yeah. the paint job on it was nice, yeah, but maybe it was like, you know, repainted probably 10 years prior. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't patina. Right. It had all the trim. It was two-tone black and white. Yeah. You know, but he start putting LS in it. Yeah. You know, put 
all obviously all new portable, you know, Dell wheels, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but it was a painted truck. Right. Right. And that was kind of, like I said, we're starting to get into the higher quality builds. You know, old ox though, to me, the reason what was so, you know, appealing to that truck was it was a tuxedo truck. It was a black and white truck. Mm -hmm. And, you know, normally seventies. So had the, the egg crate. Yeah. yeah, It it was, I think it was a 71. Um, is you know, obviously 70 of 72. Yeah. Same. Um, but you know, that truck though, it just, it had a, a presence. Mm-hmm. It had the right stance. It had all of the right parts, but it was also in, in, in full formal, hence the term tuxedo. tuxedo. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think that was also the first time that you would look at it and go, wow, that's the total package. You know, like that, that actually fits a style. Like that could be on a t-shirt type thing. Um, and, and obviously it just, you know, there's been many other people that have copied that style, but that truck to me was still kind of like a, that guy's got it. Yeah. Well, no. And that's, I mean, we started seeing more, you know, high end builds starting to come up with those, you know, especially, um, and this is kind of mix and matching because, uh, Eric Steinbrecher did have Ooh, another truck that that's was right. very, you know, hot rod mm-hmm. oriented with the second chance, you know, the bomber seats, yep. Yep. all that kind of stuff. It was a high end build, but then, you know, he started work at, at kind of the same time of old ox and all these was Tootsie yeah. starting to be built where that was full high end. I know. I mean, just tons of really nice work on it. Yes. Um, you know, full paint job, all that kind of stuff. That was also and Magnuson had a Magnuson, Magnuson on it. Supercharger. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that's also, you know, Tootsie was definitely one of those like, wow, the, the bar has just been raised, mm-hmm. you know? And like you mentioned, that's like kind of the beginning of the, the first higher end vehicles, you know? Um, and, and, and it's still to this day is a beautiful truck. Um, I know it's changed hands now, I think twice, um, since, you know, obviously Eric built it as a, as a, uh, also as a, a homage to his mom. Yeah. We're also forgetting <laughs> now that we mention it, one of the most iconic early of these was Copperhead. Oh my God. Yes. You know, we're talking, Jeez. that was a TV. Yeah. Stacey trucks, David. Gears. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was 2005. Right. And that was kind of still your 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 older cruiser right kind of a little bit street rod you know inspired but it kind of brought helped to bring that kind of truck to a lot of you know america because it was on tv well and and stacy too i mean you know he's an easy guy to watch um he's got a good style um you know he i, I think he's kind of some of the older stuff, but also some of the newer, he keeps it current, mm-hmm. right? He's not building time machines. He's also not trying to build what's the latest and greatest. And it still he looks stays good. To himself and it looks it's good. Still, I mean, you know, yeah, we just saw it later. We just saw it, you know, yeah. a couple months ago at the, at the LA uh, roaster show. I'm sorry, at the Grand National Roaster mm-hmm. Show. Um, and it still sat in a room with a bunch of trucks that are current and it, it didn't look out of place. No. You know, I mean, yeah, okay, its stance is a little taller. Um, yeah. You know, but again, too, if you if you were to say what year was that built, you would yeah, we say question. twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah. But you might question when, when it was built. You definitely wouldn't think two thousand five. It was way ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if he would have maybe linked up with you know back then two thousand five, and we're talking like Nathan Porter, is kind of your uh, only bar- guy. Uh, he yeah, wasn't even barely. He wasn't right? even really yeah. starting then. You know, I mean, we barely. didn't have we you know. Chopping block back then was still a regular lowering shop. They weren't manufacturing yeah. like well, they, they were, were working now. on newer. They're working on Chevy newer trucks because that's what was popular yeah, up. And uh, you're talking about you know, Porter built really kind of was the first to do the full replacement. You know, drop members right. and, and cross members. But um, but then obviously yeah, you started seeing GSI. Yeah, chopping block. You know, suicide doors. Oh yeah, uh, Thorbrex. You know, no limit KP components. Yes, yeah. the six seven seventy two is the popular kind of. S- help solidify not only like the truck world in its place within the overall scene of muscle cars and hot rods and classics, but, um, you know, really the C10s, a lot of companies started to build that were building muscle car parts, started to build specifically 67 to 72 C10 parts. Right. You know, whereas a lot of that wasn't kind of available before. Oh no. You had to do it kind of yourself or do it custom. I mean, obviously we talked about, Porter built, you know, slosh tubs kind of made his mark with these, you know, starting off with these trucks, but you can run down the list from CPP to AccuWare. To, and then also too, you go into the brake systems with, you know, Bayer brakes or mm-hmm. Wilwood, you could get a C10 specific bolt on, right. you know, big brake kit. Right. Um, and then, you know, TMI, you could get seats that were 
exactly bolt in for a C10. Yeah. Dash pad, you know, door panels that meant exactly for a C10. Right. So essentially, you could now build a C10 with pretty much 100% off the shelf parts. Right. From scratch. Right. You know, where all you needed was a cab. Yeah. You know, and a title. Yeah. Because you could get from LMC or AMD, you know, or Brothers. Yeah. You know, Brothers was a huge, especially the Brothers show. Right. I, mean, I remember going to that when it was, you know, the, at the same Featherly Park the week before <laughs> the F100 Nationals. Yeah. yeah. And it was, they had the same amount of trucks. They basically, both of them had about 80 to 100 trucks. And it was basically like you went one weekend if you liked Chevys, if you went another weekend if you liked Fords. Right. That was it. Yeah. And maybe you see one or two cool trucks there. Everything else was kind of the same, right. you know, style. Right. And then years later and later, and you look now, and you got almost a thousand trucks there. Well, we got, I mean, the, the C10 guys got kicked out of Featherly Park. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was- well, it got a, too big. It got too big. I mean, yeah. and the F100 guys, they still had the, their hundred people. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's the nice thing is I think that- I remember when we would call up companies and say, I'm building a C10 and I'd like to put, and let's just say brakes. Yeah. And the manufacturers were like, why? You know, who puts, no. Yeah. And, and it took, I think it took not just the magazine push, but it also took the good guys push. It took, you know. It all kind of comes together. It, yeah. In popularity and, and, you know, it's back to, okay, now the buying generation you know that's in their 30s and 40s what are they into what do they want right you know people that came before us were muscle car kids yeah. grew yeah. up in the 60s right you know before that it was guys that grew up in the 40s and 50s that liked you know tri fives and 32s right you know so they were that's what they were wanting to do you know and so that's what the industry was built around yeah now it's almost built around trucks or at least trucks have made their mark and and are a big part of, Absolutely. you know, SEMA, you know, big part of, of companies, basically their catalog is, you know, instead of maybe a couple of truck parts here and there, it's maybe it's half truck. You know, and that's funny too. I, I, um, covered the, uh, one of the first Optima challenges back in 2012 mm -hmm. and, uh, maybe it was 13. Anyways, Hellboy got invited. Yeah. So we went out there and obviously at the time I was, you know, freelancing here for for a, a truck magazine and uh so i looked around and the amount of trucks that they uh invited that time there was only about five or six trucks that were invited for for a field of about 50 muscle cars yeah let's say it was, yeah it was majority muscle cars and i remember sure. that year you know roadster shop you know phil gerber brought out that um that orange and white i want to say it might be a 70 or a 71 mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's definitely a 69 or a 70. Uh, Rob obviously had Hellboy. Um, I, I want to say Jason Hill from, uh, yeah, that right. blazer. Yeah. yeah. Not the Jason Hill from Texas, the Jason no, no, no. Hill from uh, yeah. Northern California. Northern California, yeah, um, blue and white, you know, blazer that had a full yeah, chassis. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we just hit them hard because I, I, I remember getting the guys together and getting standing on top of the Canon trailer and taking photos and but then also looking around on top of that trailer, looking at, at the, the wave of people walking over to see what we were doing. And that turned into the show. Well, it's you basically like, hey, we're here. There's only 10 percent of us trucks. Yeah. But like, let's make a big deal. out of Right. It. Right. Let's yeah. say, hey, like trucks invade the Optima, you know, make, yeah. spin it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, give it some attention. Right. And, and that really got, I think, some of the higher building guys to look like, you know, they're, they're building Corvettes or they're building Camaros and all of a sudden they're like, wow, I just got my ass kicked by a truck. Mm -hmm. Wow. I should look at these trucks. Well, and a, and a lot of companies started to do that as well, that not just making parts for it, but, right. but seeing kind of the growth there and taking advantage of, it. I remember, you know, Royal Purple, yeah. you know, they started doing a C10 day at yeah. their booth at SEMA. And a lot of times they would have a C10 in their booth, you know, uh, to show off versus, you know, a muscle car or yeah. what you'd consider your standard kind of SEMA, you know, vehicle to have. Um, and I remember, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was probably 2016 where we were like, okay, this is now C10 SEMA. Yes. You know, it like yes. the majority of vehicles at SEMA show were C10s or trucks, you know, that kind of, yeah. you know, kind of deal. And so it's kind of like, okay, it's, it's now taken over a large market of, of what, you know, what's being built out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 
it is definitely easier to build a truck now. As we mentioned, there's a lot it's of... It's not cheaper. It's not cheaper. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't want to call them catalog trucks or I don't want to call them, you know, put togethers. But, you know, they kind of are. I mean, you, you order an LS3, you order a TMI interior, you order a chassis from your manufacturer and, you know, pick your wheel. Yeah. I mean, and that's, to me, it's, yeah, you're talking about, okay, Miller, it's like, all right, what are you wanting to accomplish? Right. You're wanting to give it good performance, a good handling, good stance. You could, yeah, either try to mix match parts or do it all custom, you know, by yourself, take a lot longer. Maybe it's not as good depending on what skill level or who you're paying. Or you just order it and it's already been designed and engineered to work, to fit to perform well, like, you know what you're getting, you know? And so, yeah, it is like a, a little bit of a combination, you know, choose your own adventure yeah. on a C10, but it, it works and you can still kind of personalize it a little bit. Um, you know, I, I remember at the magazine, we were having, we had so many companies coming out with C10 parts. Yeah. We we're doing so much tech that we're like, okay, let's spin this off. Right. We do, you know, we introduced the C10 builder's guide to just focus obviously specifically on C10s because, yeah. Otherwise, we were just going to overload the magazine with it. Right. Um, but, you know, that kind of also, that became our bestseller because everyone was wanting to They're learn hot. Yeah. about it and what new parts were out there and, and, you know, how they were being built. That's right. I think, wasn't Old Ox on the cover? That was, yeah, Old Ox. That was Ox. the first one, right? Yeah, we shot that at Dell's mm-hmm. in front yeah, of, that's right. in front of uh, you know, Old Crow. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had, a, yeah, we had a, we were, the goal with that was obviously try to cover this, you know, span from 60 to 66. Right. So, you know, old ox was the kind of the primary, but in the back there was a like gray goose. It was a, yeah, it was a 60 to 66 built for a guy in Canada. Yeah. Um, and then I think even there's actually uh, a, a square body, I think in the back, far back you could see or whatever, but okay. basically that was a whole concept. Like, Hey, yeah. let's just encapsulate everything that we're doing with C10s and right. put a magazine out there and, well, the other thing, too, that I think that's really unique about C10s and, and, and why C10s are probably popular today is from the get go. And this kind of goes back to, like I mentioned, the Matt I truck. These the guys that were building C10s at this time wanted to drive them and they wanted to drive them distances, mm-hmm. you know, and before then, your your average speed guy was a drag racer. So they would build a car to go really fast down a quarter mile for a couple seconds, for a couple time. seconds. Right. And, the mo- and then the rest of the time, you just kind of cruise it around. Like, you know, even a pro street car, you don't drive a pro street car thousands of miles. They're no. horrible to drive. No, right? that's what, kind of the pro touring exactly. kind of came into that world. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of similar and, in the truck world. And yeah. C10s were exactly that. Yeah. It, you know, you've got guys that will drive. I mean, let, let's just even, you know, for argumental sake, you look, look at Dino's show. Guys will drive from Canada. Mm-hmm. I mean. In their C10. In their C10. Yeah. Not, not trailered. It. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and I think a lot of that, too, goes back to, you know, carrying those guys from IF, like driving to frickin Mississippi from California. Well, and we're <laughs> talking about, you know, the number of parts available is like, yeah, you got, you know, vintage air, rest of mod air yeah. that has a C10, you know, air right. conditioning kit, you know, or, a, you know, a replacement head unit that looks the same, but has Bluetooth on it. So yeah. you can play your, you know, music or, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's. And the TMI seats, it's it's having all of the the comforts to and and reliability right. and performance to be able to drive it around, and that wouldn't have happened if you didn't have all the early guys kind of customizing and building these and creating the demand that then mm. okay now we can create off the shelf parts for it. Right, and I think this being maybe kind of the way we wrap this up, but I think that also is where the C10 Club became a very influential thing about our, our, our passion is to be able to have a group of people that are just, Hey, we're here to have a great time. We're here to show off our trucks and have great company. Um, no drama, no problems. Well, and what was really cool with that, and, you know, obviously got like Renee and John mm-hmm. Oro is essentially it was, if you have a C10 and you're cool. Yeah. Hang out. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. You're in the club. Right. You yeah. know, you didn't have to have... No petitions you know, or no... Well, no, you didn't have to have, you know, a truck like Mike Losh's or, or Mitch Henderson's yeah. or, you know, one of uh, something that Dell, you know, built by Dell. It was, hey, maybe it's just, you know, lowered mm-hmm. or even stock and factory. As long as you're enjoying it and you're driving it, like, welcome. Come on well, in. And that's... You, you know. mentioned Renee and, and, and John Oro, and those those two guys are the ambassadors of cruising. I mean, they are just... Yeah. They are happy to see you. 
They are happy to see what you're driving. They are stoked that you're driving an old truck. No judgment. Yeah. You know, well, great and, and, guys. And the popularity of these, you know, really helped spawn, you know, and specifically the 6772, you know, spawn a lot of, you know, stuff like that, like the C10 Club to then, you know, Ronnie with C10 Talk, oh, yeah. you know, with the podcast. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you're looking at some of the Instagram stuff like C10 Era, C10 Vatos, C10 Crew. Right. A lot of that was all kind of centered around the 67 to 72 with just coming along the popularity explosion that, you know, these trucks Absolutely. kind of really helped start. And, you know, the 60 to 66 were kind of the early pioneer ones to help usher in that era. But we got, you know, another stretch of years from Chevy that's also kind of the C10 trucks, and that's the square bodies. And those kind of have a little bit of their own history to it, you know. So that's what we're going to dive into next. Yeah, I think uh, I think we should take a break because you can't stop talking about 67 and 72s. Yeah, square bodies is what's next. That's right. Mm-hmm.